which is very apropos for Canada. And, and, two, and two lovely sunny days. Yeah, and two lovely sunny days. I don't know how many seasons we'll be able to provide you with while you're here, but also, more importantly, a very warm welcome from the people of Canada and the Greek diaspora. So, first of all, it is a major honor for us to be here together to celebrate Greek Independence Day with you. So you, you honor Canada, and you actually honor, at the same time, the Greek diaspora. But let's, let's dig into it, if it's okay, for a second. So, you know, we heard earlier, and everybody's talking about The Economist and the positive view that The Economist had about Greece. But you know what? In the past, many were worried about, the, about Greece and the fiscal and economic situation. You know, we have this good news from The Economist. It's impressive uh, what you've accomplished, so congratulations. But can you give us a little bit of an insider's view? You know, with your victory back in 2019, what you inherited, what was it like in the first 100 days? Maybe just start off with day one and the first 100 days as, uh, as Prime Minister. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, your kind words, and let me wish us all you know, a happy Independence Day. It's a real honor and a pleasure for me to be with you here today. Uh, I can tell you I was blown away um, yesterday uh, in Montreal by the dynamism and the energy of the Greek-Canadian community, and I'm sure the same will happen today uh, in uh, Toronto. Uh, and as George pointed out, it has been 41 years since uh, a Greek Prime Minister has officially visited Canada. Uh, that was a long time, and I'm very, very happy to be here with you today, and happy to be with you here in Toronto to talk a little bit more uh, about Greece's uh, economic progress over the past five years. So if I were to turn the clock back to 2019, which is something I force myself to do rather frequently because it is important to take stock of the progress that we have made, when we came uh, into power in 2019, uh, Greece was still considered by many uh, the European uh, family, an economy which at the time was underperforming, still uh, in a state of uh, essential sort of monitoring by the European uh, Union, not an attractive um, uh, investment uh, destination. And we knew uh, at the time that uh, our first priority was to move Greece up to a high growth um, uh, trajectory. Of course, then we had to deal with uh, the COVID pandemic, but uh, the fundamental economic policy that we pursued uh, has overall been successful. We reasonably lowered taxes without uh, threatening the fiscal balance uh, of our macroeconomic position. We significantly improved uh, the regulatory environment, providing a, a stable uh, and predictable uh, business context for businesses to invest. And I think that uh, the story of uh, El Dorado in many ways is indicative uh, of the progress that we have achieved. And I do remember our first discussions uh, with George uh, Rightly so, the company was very frustrated with its interactions with the previous government, simply because they couldn't really figure out what exactly the government wanted to do um, um, uh, with uh, the uh, El Dorado investment. Uh, we had very honest and frank discussions, and we found a way to progress with a project that is very important uh, uh, for Greece. We set out the rules. Um, uh, El Dorado uh, delivered uh, and uh, complied. Uh, and now we have uh, a leading uh, you know, Canadian mining company active in Greece, creating hundreds, if not thousands, uh, of jobs uh, in a relatively poor area uh, of the country, engaged in uh, responsible uh, ESG uh, activity, and contributing significantly um, uh, towards uh, uh, the, you know, the Greek economy and the Greek um, uh, finances. Uh, and this is only part of the story, because we have been able to make uh, Greece an attractive investment destination for investments uh, from uh, numerous uh, sectors. Uh, just recently, a few days ago, The Economist uh, you know, published its annual survey related to the business environment, uh, and Greece posted the largest uh, improvement of any uh, other country that has been tracked uh, by The Economist. So I think there is a general consistency uh, in the story that we have been telling for the past five years. This is something which is recognized by the markets, by the uh, investors, by the uh, rating agencies. Uh, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, businesses and investors, you know, vote with their, uh, you know, they vote with their feet. And if they're active and present in Greece, uh, that means that they see significant upside for their investments. I think George is right. The story is out. And uh, now Greece is no longer the sort of eccentric, contrarian uh, story back in 2020 
It took us a lot of effort to convince people to buy into our story. Now it is much easier to do so, but we acknowledge that there is still a lot of work to be done to maintain the current momentum. Yeah, you know, what, what I find impressive is that this has happened in, in four years. You know, the interesting thing for this crowd here, and in this crowd we have uh, Canada's top business leaders and top investors, and they're interested in hearing the, the story uh, about Greece. You know, but one thing I'd like to add, when you talked about the biggest improvement in terms of the environment, Governments create the environment. You know, entrepreneurs create prosperity. And, uh, and, you know, I think the reality is is that what you've been able to do in a short period of time has been quite impressive. But it can't have been that easy. Like, the way you're just talking now, Prime Minister, it sounds like it was very easy. I became Prime Minister. We started turning things around. It's just so wonderful. But was there, no, seriously, was there a turning point for you and your colleagues? I know you're, you had the vision and you're leading the government, but was there a turning point where you said, hey, things are going to start to change perhaps sooner than we expect? Yeah, you're right to point out that obviously it was not uh, uh, a walk in the park, and there were lots of bumps uh, down the road. Uh, but what I can tell you is that I'm lucky enough to have been able to build uh, you know, a very good team uh, around me. And the fact, I think, that we had an absolute majority uh, in Parliament, both in 2019 and in 2023, made our lives much easier. Why am I saying this? If you just look at the European uh, environment now, uh, you will realize that, as, as you pointed out, of, of course, you know, the political landscape, to a great extent, determines the economic uh, environment. And there are not that many strong governments uh, with a strong mandate to actually implement uh, reforms. For example, look at a country such as Portugal, which has done well, uh, um, there has been a change in, in, in government now, but you actually have, um, you may have a minority government uh, in power, and of course that makes uh, implementing your agenda that much more difficult. But if I were to point out to one moment where I really thought that things may actually uh, turn around and that our story resonates, I would go back to a meeting I had in Davos uh, in January 2020, right before the pandemic. That was the time I first met with Microsoft, uh, and at the time, we managed to convince them uh, to make a big investment in data centers in Greece. Uh, they were the first to actually do so. Uh, and at the time, I thought, well, if, if we can convince Microsoft to actually do this, maybe others will follow. And others did follow. Um, so uh, I think that was uh, a moment where um, I felt that at least when it comes to making our case to important international investors, at least people um, were willing to listen to what we uh, had uh, to say. Of course, then we had to deal with the pandemic, uh, where we spent a lot of money, as most governments, all governments did, but I think we did it in a smart way in order to make sure that we actually save uh, jobs uh, and lay the groundwork um, for the post-pandemic recovery. Uh, and I think the second moment where I thought we are doing something important was when uh, in um, July 2020, uh, we actually managed to convince our European partners to set up what we call the Next Generation EU Fund, which is essentially a facility at the level of the European Union uh, that uh, was created uh, to channel funds to uh, member states to help them with their post-pandemic recovery. For Greece, this means an additional 36 billion euros uh, of grants and low interest uh, loans. So it was a significant additional boost uh, in terms of providing European money to complement uh, the private investments that were uh, already taking place uh, in Greece. So these are two moments where I thought that, well, maybe we are indeed moving in the right direction. And of course, probably the most important moment was our second electoral victory. Because sometimes it's easy to win the first election. Winning the second election as an incumbent in this environment is not uh, easy. So when actually the Greek people uh, gave us uh, a resounding, a second resounding uh, majority uh, in what was essentially a, a double election, then I was certain that I had convinced uh, my, the most important constituency, which is at the end of the day, our people, that we were delivering um, on our promises and that they placed their trust in us to continue for four more years. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, I always feel that uh, CEOs and citizens are the same. They want stability so that they can make decisions, so that their families can be strong, so their enterprises can be strong. But let's, let's talk about the Greek brand writ large now. There's been a lot of excitement. We've, we've talked about that. 
Everybody knows that Greece is a beautiful place to visit. We know that Greeks are welcoming people, but now they're part of the new brand or the emerging brand has to do with Greece as an emerging economic powerhouse in uh, southeastern Europe. And you know, think of, for all the folks that are here, the business leaders and investors that are here and thinking about where to put their money and where to, where to focus on future opportunities, what's the value proposition for investing in Greece? First of all, the economy is growing and I think will continue to grow at a significantly faster pace than the Eurozone average. So you're investing in a high growth economy with a stable macro uh, economic um, uh, perspective. If you look at uh, our debt to GDP ratio, it is declining at the fastest pace uh, of any uh, OECD country. So there is no longer uh, a country risk associated with what went wrong 10 years ago. We've left the years of the financial crisis behind us for good. And this, of course, for any investor also means opportunities because asset prices uh, were significantly uh, depressed. Um, the Greek economy is a relatively well-diversified economy with certain sectors where we can afford to be, we can to say that we're global leaders. For example, tourism and hospitality is attracting significant investment as we move our tourism product uh, uh, up market. Renewables, uh, we are producing 50% of our electricity just from wind uh, and solar. Uh, we're one of the leading countries um, uh, in the world when it comes to these types uh, of renewables. Greece is a um, logistics uh, center, a natural entry point for trade from the east towards the west or from the west towards the east. Greece has uh, the leading economy uh, in uh, the broader region of the Balkans uh, and uh, Eastern um, uh, Europe. Uh, Greece as a technology center. This may surprise you, but we have uh, a very vibrant um, uh, tech industry uh, in Greece uh, with many startups, quite a few unicorns that have been created uh, out of Greece, which uh, leverage what is essentially, in my mind, our, our hidden asset, which is a talent uh, of, our, um, uh, of our people, a public university system that produces um, highly trained uh, um, young Greeks eager to work. When, for example, Pfizer came to Greece to set up uh, an AI and big data center, they went to Thessaloniki, our second largest uh, city. They did not go to Athens. Uh, they started with, uh, you know, 200 people, and they'll be close to 1,000 people uh, by the end of the year. Why did this happen? Because they found great talent. Uh, and, of course, uh, the other great advantage of Greece is our fantastic diaspora uh, and the links that we can build um, you know, with uh, the Greeks abroad. 500,000 Greeks left Greece, young Greeks left Greece during the financial crisis. And at a time when talent is scarce, uh, these people, some of these people, would be eager to return to Greece, provided they can find uh, good um, uh, job um, uh, opportunities. Add to that the fact that there are significant European funds, as I told you, to complement uh, private capital that will be deployed to Greece. And of course, as, I, uh, as we discussed previously, a stable government. We have three years ahead of us, um, you know, a full, uh, you know, second term uh, mandate to deliver uh, reforms and a commitment by us to build upon our success because it is easy when you win a second term uh, to become complacent. Uh, and I will make sure that this does not happen and my team knows that if anything, we need to push the accelerator uh, rather than the brake. Uh, I don't take any, anything that we have achieved for granted. And I've always believed that you need at least two terms uh, in order to make sure that the country has turned the corner for good. You know, uh I think we could talk a lot about the value proposition. You know, you talk about the opportunity, the stability, the diversity of the economy. So let's shift gears for a second and let's talk about Canada and Greece, two nations, the partnership between those two countries. I know you've been in discussions and met with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, what would you like to see happen uh, when it comes to strengthening the future friendship and the economic partnership between Greece and Canada? I've had very productive meetings with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Greece and Canada uh, are two liberal democracies. We share the same values. Uh, we are sitting on the same side of the fence when it comes to the big geopolitical challenges of our day, you know, from Ukraine um, to Gaza. We're both struggling 
uh, with um, uh, issues related to climate change, both on the mitigation but also on the adaptation front. Uh, we had an opportunity to sign with, uh, in the presence of Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, a new important contract. Uh, we are buying um, seven uh, state-of-the-art uh, um, uh, planes to help us with our firefighting uh, efforts, partly financed by uh, the European Union. And of course, we're also sharing experiences when it comes to uh, managing uh, environmental challenges uh, such as uh, wildfires. But of course, when you look at the uh, economic cooperation, uh, when I look at our level of trade, it's still relatively low. We can do much better. When I look at the foreign direct investment uh, by Canadian companies into Greece, there were some important investments, some that have taken, that have already you know, materialized. Eldorado Gold uh, is one of them. Fairfax has, uh, and my good friend Prem Watsa has uh, invested actively uh, in Greece and is one of the big champions uh, of um, the Greek success story, not just in financial services, banks, insurance, but now uh, also in, uh, in, in real estate uh, and tech. We had PSP investing uh, in the Athens airport, which we um, floated um, uh, a few weeks ago. It was an incredibly successful uh, transaction. So there is already a backbone of Canadian investment uh, that uh, has been directed towards Greece. Now the challenge is to move beyond uh, these uh, sort of champions of Greek-Canadian uh, economic ties uh, into a new generation uh, of investors who could take advantage of the significant opportunities uh, that Greece has to offer. But it, it goes both ways because we also have Greek companies now, for example, the Mytilineos Group, uh, which plans to invest more than a billion euros in the biggest uh, um, uh, PV um, um, installation in uh, Alberta. This means that we are also leveraging our know-how in order to invest in Canada uh, and sort of complement the green uh, transition of Canada by making sure that you also add uh, renewables, which you will definitely need uh, in your uh, energy mix in the future. Yeah, so you've talked about investment opportunities. You've talked about state-to-state -state partnership and those types of opportunities. You mentioned the Greek diaspora. If you had a call to action for the Greek diaspora in Canada, what would it be? You got, here you go. You got the message. Well... What are you thinking? Uh, first of all, for the first time in these elections, you will be able to vote through postal voting. So please, <laughs> this was always, why am I saying this? It was not obvious. And we have two uh, sort of ministers uh, here, Minister Thodorikakos, who was the ex-Minister of Interior, and Minister Karameos, who is the Minister of, of Interior, working very hard to make sure that we uh, extend the right to vote to our diaspora. We started uh, in the previous elections uh, by setting up um, um, you know, voting stations uh, in our embassies uh, and our, our consulates, but now we moved a step further. Now you can actually vote uh, by simply, if you have a right to vote in Greece, by simply registering on, our, uh, on, on the site of the Ministry of Interior, and you, for the first time we'll be using postal voting uh, in order for you to participate in the European elections. And this is incredibly important for us, because this essentially is a trial run what will happen in the national elections. So I understand that the European elections may not be the most important elections um, um, uh, for you to participate, but we need a high number of participation in order to convince those skeptics uh, back in the Greek parliament that we actually need to extend um, the same, um, uh, not just the same right, but offer the same um, uh, flexibility when it comes to the national elections. So please participate in the elections. It is uh, important. There will also be you know, candidates representing um, uh, the Greek-Canadian uh, uh, community. And the European elections are uh, uh, important because what happens in Europe matters for Greece. It also matters for Canada because um, uh, Europe and Canada are our partners. And we're not just talking here about you know, the, our free trade agreements. We are partners when it comes to facing all the big uh, challenges of today. And there are quite a few of those that we need to address. Yeah, exactly. You know, when we talk about the geopolitical situation, you think of things about the war in Ukraine with Russia, think about what's happening in the Middle East. We think about people, and you know what? Canadians and people in Greece worried about energy costs, worry about the cost of, of food. Uh, not an easy time for for anyone. Let's, let's do a little bit of a finer point on the impact from a trade and supply chain perspective of how the conflict in the Ukraine is rewiring basically our, uh, our, our global economy. And I'd like you to talk a little bit, because 
One of the most interesting, exciting things that I've heard about uh, is the uh, India Middle East European corridor. Tell me about what the vision is, or share with the group what the vision is for that and what it means for Greece, because I think this is at the heart of where Greece is probably going to go. First of all, obviously the war in Ukraine has changed many things on the European continent. Europe, certain economies in Europe in particular, were for a long time incredibly dependent on cheap Russian gas. This has changed, and I think it has changed for good, which means now we need to be more dependent in the short to medium term uh, on imported LNG. And Greece has an important role to play because we are the natural entry point for LNG, not just for Greece, but also for the Balkans. Uh, we're actually sending gas to Ukraine as we speak. So we're using the old sort of Russian pipelines, uh, reversing their flow, and uh, sending gas from the south to the north. So this means that Greece has an important geopolitical role to play as an energy security provider um, for the broader region. But when you look at the way trade flows um, will shift over the next years, uh, over the next decades, uh, what you described, the in, uh, India, Middle East, uh, uh, Europe corridor, is for me an incredibly visionary strategic project. Because if you look at India's position as a growing powerhouse, uh, uh, as, a, uh, as probably the third largest economy uh, by 2030, uh, an, an alternative sort of uh, provider uh, of, of goods and services to, to China, how are the Indian goods going to find their way into the European market? Well, you just have to look at the map to understand that this alternative corridor, which essentially is also bypassing um, Suez and, uh, and the Red Sea, um, its end point is Greece, its continental Greece, our ports, uh, our railroad um, uh, networks, our logistics centers uh, have a, will have a very important role to play. And right now we see tremendous interest uh, in investment in logistics in Greece, and it makes a lot of sense uh, because uh, we have the infrastructure, we have the port, we're investing uh, in our trains, so especially if you look at the area around the, you know, around the Piraeus port, this is becoming a world-class leading uh, logistics center. Uh, of course, this is a long-term uh, project, but if one believes uh, in the potential of India, as I do uh, when I look at the growth of the Indian economy and, and its dynamism, uh, and the fact that India will have, uh, I think, a strong partnership with uh, Europe, uh, one can understand why Greece's role uh, in that uh, sort of emerging um, mega trade partnership is going to be so important. You know, um, if I if I may, Prime Minister, it sounds like you're drawing a new map where Greece is right at the very center of the world when it comes to the intersection of uh, Canada, India, Asia. Uh, well, the you know <laughs> the the Oracle in Delphi had made that case uh, <laughs> you know two and a half thousand years ago. So uh, well, there we go. Excellent. You know, you were talking a little bit earlier about the uh, acquisition of uh, planes to fight forest fires. And, you know, I, uh, you know, what's interesting, one thing that is shared between Canada and Greece is fighting forest fires and, Greece and, and forest fires that we in Canada had to deal with um, in northern Quebec. And we know that the same thing was happening in, uh, in Greece. We know that people are worried about climate change. Uh, but can you take a moment to talk about the green economy? in Greece and uh, climate change. Is it an opportunity? Is it a cost? Is it both? How do you, uh, how do you land on that? It's, it's both a threat and an opportunity. But, uh, one needs to be aware of the fact that you know, climate-related disasters can be incredibly expensive to manage. For example, we had a big flood uh, in Thessaly, in the central part of Greece, which is uh, our main agricultural region in September, a freak storm. Uh, one of those storms that scientists tell us happen once in a thousand years, but we're never quite sure if that is you know, statistically relevant in this new uh, environment uh, of, a, of a climate uh, crisis. Uh, so these uh, um, extreme events you know, cost us a lot of money, which means that prevention is incredibly important, and that is why I place as much emphasis on adaptation as I do on mitigation. Uh, Europe is a leader when it comes to mitigation in the sense that it has set very clear targets to become carbon neutral by 2050. And we have a very clear path 
towards reaching carbon neutrality. We know it's going to be difficult. We know it's going to cost a lot of money. But I'm afraid that if we don't think um, um, more proactively about adaptation, which means dealing with the climate crisis today or tomorrow, we may actually lose the support of our population in terms of uh, making sure that they are on board when it comes to the medium to long-term transition that we, need, uh, that we need to make. So anything that has to do related to prevention, um, uh, we, we place much more emphasis now uh, on, uh, on, on prevention, even when it comes to forest fires, uh, active forest management. These are um, um, sort of policy areas where we can learn a lot uh, from Canada. It was never really a priority. Uh, in Greece, uh, more work uh, and more investment in anti-flood um, uh, protection. Uh, these investments actually uh, make a lot of economic uh, sense because you look at the damage uh, that you have to um, uh, sort of uh, deal with in case of an extreme climate event, and it is very expensive. Issues such as uh, insuring against climate disasters, also a big topic for the global uh, financial uh, industry. For example, we are now in the process of rethinking the way our farmers insure themselves against uh, uh, agricultural uh, damages. Uh, uh, but of course, it can also create some opportunities. Uh, and let me shift, for example, to tourism. One of our main challenges in, uh, in Greece is to extend the season. And we don't necessarily want people to come to Greece in July and August, where it's going to be crowded and maybe very hot. Uh, and we're trying to market Greece as a year-round uh, destination. And as uh, you know, the, the pattern of people, uh, how they travel actually change, we see that this is actually happening. So our season starts in March in many places. You know, can end in October uh, or uh, November. We want to make sure that flights from Canada to Greece or from Greece to Canada are available year-round, because right now, unfortunately, they're not. Um, uh, that's something we need to... Uh, work on, uh, but uh, you know, climate change is also going to have an impact when it comes to our um, uh, tourist product, and we need to be aware that this is a, a reality that we need to manage. Super. Okay, final question. You know, you brought up the Oracle of Delphi, right? So let's fast forward 20, 30, 40 years from now. You, as Prime Minister, you have successfully served your country, and you're retired. I don't know if your wife can believe that, but you are retired. Now, reflecting on your vision for Greece, what's the Greece that you want your grandchildren and great-grandchildren to inherit? It's the first time I, you know, someone puts this question to me, but it's an interesting one, <laughs> um, especially the 30 to 40 year. I'll be very old by then, so... Uh, <laughs> Hopefully, I'll still be, uh, you know, relatively healthy to enjoy my uh, my grandchildren. But I've been very clear in terms of what I want to achieve with with the country. I want Greece to be a prosperous European country, not a lagger, but a protagonist. If you look at countries such as Ireland, for example, that entered the European Union uh, uh, in the 70s and were very poor, and now are way ahead of the European uh, uh, sort of uh, average in terms of. Uh, um, uh, you know, per capita uh, GDP. I want Greece to be, you know, one of those countries that has actually made this great leap forward. But I want to make sure that the growth we develop has very specific characteristics, that it's uh, uh, sustainable, that we focus a lot on the protection of the environment, which in our case is absolutely critical for our main industry, which is tourism. It's inconceivable to think uh, um, uh, about any other way to develop tourism. But to focus on sustainable uh, tourism. And I want to make sure that we address what I think is the fundamental problem of liberal democracies today, which is income inequality. Uh, at the root cause of the discontent within liberal democracies lies the great disparity of wealth between those who have a lot of capital, a lot of wealth, and those who are left behind. So in my mind, the growth that we need to create needs to be more equitable. I'm a firm believer uh, in the dynamics of the market. Um, I'm uh, not a socialist, don't get me wrong. Uh, but I fundamentally believe that issues of income inequality need to be uh, addressed and everybody needs to prosper um, uh, from a growing economy. For example, um, next week we'll be legislating our fourth increase in the minimum wage. 
I can't tell you what the increase will be because it's a still um, a, a secret, but we want to make sure um, that workers actually uh, really benefit from a, uh, from a growing economy. So um, uh, my goal would be to have, uh, you know, uh, a truly, you know, world sort of well-functioning um, democracy where people get, you know, good access to public goods, good um, education, uh, uh, good health care, uh, and uh, in, in a country that uh, focuses more on the happiness and the well-being of people. Well, uh, thank you, Prime Minister. There you have it, Prime Minister Kiriakos Mitsotakis. Wise words, a compelling vision. You know, I'm sure for all the uh, folks in the room here, they're going to be interested in uh, bigger, better, more exciting news about Greece as a place to invest, as a place to visit, as a place to live, and uh, to take the strength that you've built in your first mandate to even greater strength. So with that, if everyone, let's give a big round of applause to the Prime Minister.